Today we're going to talk about how technology can eat bureaucracy, but we're going to begin with a deeply personal story. Uh, this is a story about how our family got a bonus three years with my father, uh, but it is also the most awesome example we have of the creative application of data and technology. And it all started with this. On the screen is a pancreatic cancer cell, and on May of 2008, my father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, most people in this room probably know that that prognosis is grim. We were told we had no hope, and it didn't matter whether we went to John Hopkins or Mayo Clinic or MD Anderson. Anywhere in the world that we went, what we were told is there's no hope, there's nothing you can do. And this was, of course, corroborated by all the online clinical trial websites and the professional sites. And yet, there were a few of these patient communities where people that self-identified as patients had actually been posting for quite some time. So being a data geek, we did a really scientific exercise. We pulled out Excel and started to write down the first post date of every individual. And when we were done, only 11 people, only 11 people had been posting for over a year. So we made a personal appeal to all 11. Nine of them responded by the next morning, and seven were on the same clinical trial. That was the ultimate gift to our family because almost immediately my dad's energy level went up. Uh, he was smiling. We were traveling as a family. We had dinner almost every night. That is almost almost 1,000 dinners because we refuse to blindly follow the expert advice. Now, I know that most of us aren't dealing with life and death decisions, but what I would propose to you is that that data was always there. It required us to push on it differently, to take a different lens to it, and the data you have shapes how you see the world and therefore the possibilities that are available to you. The other thing that we want you to consider is that none of those data sources existed merely a decade ago. So the question that that brings is, in our personal lives and at work, what new data sources exist today uh, that can help you make better decisions? Now, to really drive this point home of the experts not always having the most current information, let's take a quick trip down memory lane. Now, this was a real ad in the 1960s. Now, you can see these physicians, they weren't trying to hurt anybody. In the short term, cigarettes, they kind of make you feel better. And we didn't have the longitudinal data to understand that this was a really bad idea. Now, if we rewind the clock another 30 years, all the way back to the 1930s, radium, it made your skin glow, literally. <laughs> and 20 years before that, hallelujah, heroin from our friends at Bayer to treat your kid's cough. Now, these are ridiculous. Why would I show these ads? This is a group of intelligent people. There's no way that you would accept the medical care 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, not for anybody that you love. So why would I show these ads? Well, the reason is that we all wake up every morning and we go into offices where we practice management rituals that are a lot older than any of these ads. Now, this is in our idea. Gary Hamill, widely considered the leading thinker on management today, points to the fact that technology of management is a technology and that it was invented when we were changing from an agrarian society to an industrial society. Now, coincidentally, Henry Ford said something really interesting around that same time. He said that if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And today I'm going to argue that email is the ultimate faster horse. Email is simply a digitized memo. Its language traces its roots to the days of the carbon copy. But what makes email much worse is that email is a great way to let other people reprioritize your day for you. It it gives people the illusion that they're going faster, while in fact allowing others to reprioritize their day for them. Now, email is not alone. Data 2, it's been around for a long time. These companies on the screen, anybody remember them? They use data. They use data to extract value from us. They use data to market to us on their terms. They use data to optimize supply chains, to maximize margins. And then these companies came along. And what they did is they simply shifted the data lens to be in the service of their customers, to better enable, to better empower their customers. Their insight is so obvious in hindsight that merely a decade later, we've forgotten. Their obvious insight is that one of the deepest rooted human emotions is the feeling of being understood. Which brings us to the premise of our book, it's a deceptively simple question. What would happen if organizations understood their own people better than they understand their customers? And it's deceptively simple because everybody here intuitively understands both the answer and the benefits. It's why Amazon shows us only the things we're interested in, why Facebook curates our news feed for individual relevance, and why applications like Spotify and Netflix are actually differentiated on algorithms that learn our preferences to customize our experiences. In fact, at home we have choice, and so we choose to do business with companies that take the time to understand us and personalize our news, shopping, entertainment, travel, and other needs. But then 
we go into work. And at work, it's all one size fits all policies, processes, and tools. The result is an epidemic that isn't getting nearly enough attention. Today, 70% of workers are disengaged at work. 24% of workers are actively disengaged, which means they wake up every morning, they get dressed, they drive into work, and then they work to deliberately undermine the missions of the companies that employ them. <laughs> Now, it's not funny, don't laugh, because it's going to require people at work to solve all of humanity's greatest challenges. And whether your issue is health care, climate change, or anything else, I'm going to propose to you that it's going to require people working in those organizations. And those organizations are going to have managers, and management is a technology. Now, when you think about technology more broadly, think about the state of health care 100 years ago, think about automotive, aerospace, high tech. Now, let's contrast that with work then, and now. Not funny, again. This is really a big problem. Technology is radically transforming industries, but the technology of management is not keeping pace. Said differently, businesses are rapidly evolving, work is not. In fact, if we were to take apart this pie chart and replace the word email with memo, this could represent the life of a worker a century ago. Now, we all know what a great day feels like, a day where you're able to keep the most important thing, the most important thing, that indescribable feeling, that sense of accomplishment. Some of us call it flow, some of us call it being in the zone, peak, whatever you want to call it, you know what it feels like, but I would argue that we leave sparse time for us to experience that. Consider, for example, one of the most frustrating relics from our agrarian roots, the annual performance review. Now, if I were to ask everybody here what's wrong with them, everybody here would have an answer. And guess what? We would all be right. It turns out 97.2% of us do them, 98% of us believe that they suck, and 58% of the people that design them agree that they suck. But we still do them. We still do them. This is what training looked like 50 years ago. This is what training looks like today. It's a little bit unfair because we have digitized it, we put it on the screen, but it's still fundamentally point in time, one size fits all. And process is really where we see the biggest opportunity. Organizations today, we're drowning in process. We have process for everything. We have process for planning and process for budgeting and process for approvals. We have process to change process and process to communicate and train on the now change process. It's too much. And it's like this plaque that's clogging organizational arteries, causing businesses to go slower and slower. Now, process is a risk mitigation strategy, but experience is a much better predictor of risk. And what we would propose to you is that there is no reason in a day and age where data is so cheap to store and process, that the process should be the same the first time and the hundredth time that anybody does anything. The first time is a teachable moment. Now, a teachable moment is a great opportunity to pair somebody up with an expert, to give them a training intervention at a time when they're going to get the practice and feedback that they need to actually learn. But with every time that somebody demonstrates competence, can't we relax the bureaucracy? Now, what's really frustrating about this is that we've solved this problem in our personal lives. Who here wrote down step-by-step -step directions on how to get over here? We don't do that anymore because we can rely on these applications. More and more of us are using health trackers to help us achieve our fitness goals, or in my case, constantly reminding me to eat less, move more, sleep and smile. Now, in our research, what we were really looking for is where are the organizations that are taking inspiration from the consumer landscape and pulling it into the workplace? And the good news is that yet again, we found a great deal of companies that are essentially shifting the data lens yet again, but this time inward to better enable and to better empower their own people. Now, in the high-performance world of Formula One racing, this has been happening for a long time. Ferrari was the first one to build one of these. On the screen is a sensing and actuating center. And what this nurse center does is it collects billions of data points in real time during a race because every team thinks they have the winning strategy until reality punches them in the face. And it turns out that the difference that made the difference was being able to coach the driver by whispering in their ear things like, you know what, you can skip the pit or you can go harder on the brakes. And so our question to you is, why is it that in the workplace technology is business rules driven, which makes it like this referee that's yelling offside when in fact there's an opportunity to use lead indicators and predictive technologies to coach our people, to whisper in their ear at the right time so that that technology can act as a coach. Here to share a lot more about the three principles that make up a Dakota company is Jay Goldman. Thank you, Lee. 
So our book really explores three principles that make a decoded company. And we found examples of these in lots of companies that we would consider hypergrowth. They're companies that are growing at potentially exponential rates, but we also found lots of examples of them in companies that are older or more mature. Let me illustrate tech as a coach with an example from UPS. Maybe not the most innovative company that might have come to mind, but one that is a data powerhouse in terms of all the data they have about the packages in their network. Consider how much data gets produced when you ship a package through UPS. Now think about all the ways that they use that data today, but there are lots of ways that they can use it. They started to have a problem with their drivers. The drivers were complaining that their shifts were getting longer. It was more complicated to route all the packages to where they needed to go, and there were more accidents that were happening as traffic got bigger in cities that the drivers were driving in. So UPS crunched all of that data that they had, and 80 pages of math later, they came up with a system called Orion. Orion is a guidance system. It's either handheld or heads up for the drivers, and it gives them routing information about the best way to go. Now, this seemed like a big win, but the drivers didn't want it. They said, we're not going to become robots that just blindly follow the directions of this Orion system. So UPS said, that's OK. Let's try a little experiment here. We're going to divide you up into three different groups. In our first group, you didn't want Orion, so you don't get it. Just keep doing exactly what you were doing before. In our second group, you're going to get Orion, but if you think Orion is wrong, you should do what you think is right. And in our third group, we're going to give you Orion anyway, and you just follow everything that it tells you to do, even if you think it's wrong, just for the purpose of this experiment. So they ran the experiment, and it's probably no surprise that that middle group was the one that really did the best. In fact, their performance was considerably better than the other two groups. When you pair our instincts with the analytics that modern technology can provide, you end up with a far significant result, very similar to Ferrari in the example that Lee shared. So technology can now become a coach. It can guide our people to better performance instead of just a referee that yells at them when they're offside or they violated some business rule. Our second principle, which builds on the first, is data as a sixth sense. It's not intended to replace any of your primary senses, but we can now equip people with just the right amount of information at just the right time to help them make better decisions faster. We call this informed intuition. So I'll give you an example. By virtue of Whole Foods, one of the world's largest retailers and certainly one of the most successful. Whole Foods has an almost unprecedented amount of data that they share internally in the company. By way of an example, and an example that makes some people uncomfortable, Whole Foods shares all of their compensation information internally. If you want to know how much anybody else at Whole Foods make, you can look it up in a system on their website, and that system will tell you everybody from the CEO all the way down to a stock person at a store exactly how much compensation they have. Now, their information sharing doesn't stop there. In fact, their store managers receive a huge packet of information once a week about everything that's happening across the entire chain, not just in their store or their region. And they have complete autonomy to make the right decisions for their store based on the information in there about what's selling in other places, about prices, about compensation, and all of that information. It's informing their intuition to make better decisions at exactly the time when they need it. The third principle, which we call engineered ecosystems, is the idea that we can take control of our company's cultures and our ecosystems, and that we can intentionally design something that's different than what might have organically evolved. So I'll give you an extreme example. In our research, we came across lots of companies that engineer their own ecosystems, that have taken control of their cultures and done very intentional things with them. But the most extreme example that we came across was a company called Valve. If any of you are gamers, you may recognize Valve. They are one of the most successful gaming companies in history. Privately held company worth about $5 billion, a few hundred employees, and they've made some of the biggest blockbuster games that have happened. Now, Valve isn't just a good example of a gaming company. They are also an extreme example of an ecosystem triumphing over a hierarchy. There is no hierarchy at Valve. There are literally no managers in the organization. It is a completely flat company. All of the people there get to choose what they want to work on, and they don't do that through some complex system of voting or some elaborate system that they have to log into. Their desks are literally on wheels, and if they don't like the project they're working on, they just roll their desk over to another project that they think that they can contribute to and add value, and that's the project that they join. They have to be very careful about the project that they join, because at the end of every project, the whole project team stack ranks everybody in terms of the value of the contribution they've made. 
So don't join a project that you can't add value to. And when you join a project, make sure that you are actually adding value. Now, that's a pretty extreme example. I wouldn't advocate that everybody here go out tomorrow and abolish the entire hierarchy of your company. But I would say that what we really like about that example is that it challenges you to think about your thinking. We are in an unprecedented age of change. The rate of change has accelerated considerably, as Lee said earlier. And it's led us to new technologies and new abilities that we never had before. Yet we tend to approach problems with the same thinking that we had when we created them, to quote Einstein. So what we encourage everybody to do, if you have one takeaway from this talk, it's to go out there and really think about your thinking. Realize that there are new ways to do things and new ways to use data to help technology eat your bureaucracy. Thank you. It's great and, and it's interesting. If you're a boss, you can do it. If you design your own system. But what do you do if you're part of a system? I think you have to lead by example. If you do something that makes you very successful, other people in your organization will look to that success and seek it out for themselves. So if you choose to adopt some of these ideas with your small teams, you don't look for a massive corporate rollout or even permission to do this. The success that those ideas bring you will be an inspiration to the people around you, and they will, by inspiration, follow in your footsteps. Change itself is changing, and, and, uh, and the human mind is starting to struggle to comprehend the pace of change. Uh, but one of the things that people say is that they love change, and they, they don't actually. They love change that they're driving, that they're involved in. So if you're going to lead by example and do this in your own team, uh, make sure that it's an a very inclusive exercise, because that way you lead by example, and then other people will try to emulate your behavior, and you'll be a center of gravity for change in your larger organization. Thank you. Thank you.